federal government's decision to reduce northern cod quotas next year gets mixed reviews. Well-known Newfoundland author Cassie Brown died today in St. John's. She was 67. Here and now. Good evening, I'm Greg Stamp. Also on tonight's show, a look at changes coming up in the Canada Pension Plan and their impact on many of us. Here's Carl Wells with the Regional News. Thank you, Greg. Good evening. The reduction in cod quotas for next year's offshore fishery is meeting with mixed reviews. An organization representing inshore fishermen and inshore companies thinks the cuts should have been deeper. Another organization representing offshore companies and most inshore companies thinks the cuts may be even deeper than they appear. Rick Seward reports. The offshore northern cod fishery has been under pressure recently because of scientific studies suggesting stocks may not be as healthy as generally thought. As a nod to that possibility, the new offshore quotas for next year have been reduced 10,000 tons, a loss of about $20 million for the industry. The spokesman for the fish company's organization thinks that's fair under the circumstances. It's our understanding that the best, uh, latest uh, scientific information available is, is that the stocks, in fact, are in uh, reasonably good shape, that the, the biomass is increasing, and we really don't anticipate this to be a trend. Now, that is a but there's also concern that the minister should clarify some things, especially a decision which appears to include discarded fish, or fish that are too small, into the allocation. According to the fish companies, that could mean the cutback is twice as big as it appears. It's just not clear, but certainly it's an area of, of major concern to the offshore fleet. But another organization representing just the inshore fishermen and inshore fish companies says that the cutback was minimal, and they accuse the minister of going against the advice of his own scientific advisors. Really, they're saying now that the stocks haven't rebuilt to any great extent, and, uh, and the fish that uh, we've given to our offshore Canadian companies are as fish that we've, we normally would have been catching inshore, so, uh, so the stocks haven't, re haven't rebuilt to uh, support an offshore effort. There is also a suggestion that the federal government, which is negotiating the sale of its shares in FPI, the fishing giant, didn't dare reduce quotas for fear of making it more difficult to sell the company. We basically think that the overriding influence with the minister could very well be the fact that the uh, offshore companies are looking towards privatization. You know, and if you take away an enterprise allocation given to them, it could have effects on their sales of the, uh, op of the operation. So I'm not at liberty to say any more, but it just happens to be that we think that that may be what's influencing the, uh, influencing the uh, minister to go above what the uh, Atlantic Groundfish Advisory Committee is recommending. In a way, this fight between the inshore and offshore sectors is a story that's as old as mankind itself, people fighting over a scarce resource. But as we enter the new year, we're also entering a new phase in that dispute. The inshore sector is more organized than ever before, so we can expect to be hearing a lot more about it. Rick Seward, CBC News, Petty Harbor. Despite the claim by the Inshore Fisheries Association that the reduction in northern cod allocations didn't go far enough, the president of the Newfoundland Fishermen's Union sees it as a step in the right direction. However, Richard Cashin says he's even more encouraged by Ottawa's decision to order an equal harvest in all three zones of the northern cod stock, known as 2J3KL. The union has long held that overfishing by the deep sea companies in one of those three zones, 3K, was directly responsible for the troubled inshore fishery along the northeast coast in recent years. Cashin was in our studio and spoke with Greg. Mr. Cashin, a 10,000 ton reduction in the northern cod allocation to the deep sea companies, the Inshore Fisheries Association says that's simply not good enough and they represent many of the same people that you represent and yet you seem to be satisfied. Well, I would have picked 20,000, but I think the important thing that's been overlooked is the major accomplishment in the new fishing plan is that the offshore effort in the 3K area will be cut in half a reduction of 30 or 40,000 tons in that area. And that is the area that feeds the inshore fishery. And I think that's a very significant development. If you were going to pick a figure, then it should have been reduced by 20,000 tons. The problem the minister has is to be even-handed. In the Gulf of St. Lawrence, which is almost exclusively an inshore fishery used resource, the scientific advice was for an, a reduction of in excess of 30,000 tons, which would have been devastating to inshore fishermen, and the minister ch chose a different route to phase it in, and he applied the same principle in 2J3KL, 
and that appears to me to be even-handed. But I think the real accomplishment here is the division of the resource, and I expect next year, if the world doesn't change, to have a further reduction of at least another 10,000 tons, maybe 20,000 tons. How optimistic are you that the reduction that has taken place, plus the, uh, the call for a more equal harvest in 2J, 3KL, how optimistic are you that that will result in a better year next year for the inshore fishery? Well, no one knows about next year over the long haul, then obviously it's consistent with what all of the inshore advice has been, is that it's this 3K area that feeds the bulk of the inshore fishery on the East Coast. And a reduction by up to half of offshore effort is bound to have a major impact on the sort of uh, mother stock for the inshore fishery. The suggestion has been made that the expected sale of FPI made government reluctant to tamper with the deep sea quotas. Uh, do, you, do you believe that might no, be a I, factor? No, I don't, because I, I happen to represent and know the fishermen, inshore fishermen in 4RS, who were frightened to death that the government was going to reduce their quota uh, fully, uh, and uh, the government and they recommended to the government the inshore fishermen on the west coast for a phase in, and so I think that that was an influencing factor. I think the other factor was obviously that in 1987 is the last year we're going to have this LTA arrangement of 10,000 tons, and I would expect uh, that in '88 we will have further reductions. But I'm optimistic with the with the change in 3K. I think that's very important. Do you think in light of the fact that the inshore fishery is having the trouble that it is having and that Fisheries and Oceans recommended a reduction of 20,000 tons and you say perhaps that might have been the right thing to do, do you think that it's a, it's a bit odd that, that government was so conservative in its reduction? Well, I think you have to look, uh, th they've made a dramatic change. I think it's unknown at all what the impact on the offshore sector is going to be of having to fish 2J. I mean, it may well be that they will not be able to harvest their quota. And that, uh, I think that that's something that could have serious implications for the offshore sector and lead to a lot of layoffs in this province. So I think that uh, as far as that is concerned, uh, uh, the uh, minister was harder on the offshore sector 2J, 3KL than he was on the inshore uh, sector of 4RS in, in terms of uh, the uh, coping with this new management advice. So I don't think you can fault him on those grounds. Okay, Mr. Cashin, thank you very much. Cassie Brown is dead at age 67. The famous Newfoundland author suffered a severe heart attack on Saturday night. She was admitted to the Grace Hospital and died there at approximately 3 o'clock this morning. Pauline Thornhill prepared this report on the talented Newfoundlander whose work was inspired by the sea. Cassie Brown loved to sit by the sea. She said it used to calm her. It also helped her become an accomplished author. When she appeared on CBC's Authors several years ago, two of her books had been published, Death on the Ice and A Winter's Tale. Brown is best known for Death on the Ice. The account of the Newfoundland sealing disaster of 1914 gained her international recognition. It sold nearly 10,000 copies. Six years of research went into that book. In writing it, she immersed herself in the lives of the sealers. And I was there, and I walked over the ice with them. I was freezing to death with them, uh, and I was hungry with them. I was cold to the marrow of my bones with them. Her second book, A Winter's Tale, told the story of the Florizel, a luxury steamship that shipwrecked on a voyage from St. John's to Halifax. At the time of this interview, Brown was still working on her third publication, Standing into Danger. This also revolved around sea disaster. It's the story of two U.S. warships and a cargo ship that ran aground and the heroic rescue of over 180 survivors. The three ships went ashore about roughly a mile to a mile and a half apart on a very desolate part of the uh, Buren Peninsula. Cassie Brown is recognized as a classic Newfoundland author. She's in the Encyclopedia of Newfoundland and Labrador, and her novels are a part of many school curriculums. Cassie Brown, dead at 67. I'm Pauline Thornhill. A three-member commission has been appointed to examine the impact of the introduction of aluminum cans on jobs in the province's brewing industry. The provincial government appointed Judge Gordon Seabright to chair the commission.
John McNamee of Islington, Ontario, and Dr. James Barnes of the Faculty of Business at Memorial are the other two members. The province wants all interested parties to make their views known to the Commission. NAEP and the provincial government may be preparing to lock horns once again. Both sides have yet to reach an agreement on hospital support staff. The union says government is offering less than in the current contract and is pushing NAEP towards a confrontation. Deanne Fleet reports. NAEP represents 4,800 hospital support workers in 48 institutions across the province. The union also has a separate contract for support workers at the Waterford Hospital. NAEP has been negotiating for a new agreement with government since the fall, but making no headway. I believe at this point in time there's a clear message been sent to us by the employers negotiating team that they intend to be extremely tough this time out and are going to take us on. Dave Curtis is NAEP's chief negotiator. He says government has offered no money and fewer benefits than are in the current contract. There's just a whole list that goes on some 50 items and they're all takeaways or, or modifications that would lessen the benefit to the member. About 2,500 hospital support workers belong to a different union, CUPE. It signed a two-year agreement with government in July that CUPE says gave workers more than an 8% salary increase without having to make any concessions to government on the previous contract. Even CUPE says government seems to be acting tougher with NAEP. CUPE took a strike vote before it settled, an illegal strike vote because there were no essential employees designated under Bill 59. NAEP won't say whether it will do the same, but it's obviously an option. If government maintains its stand, the alternatives are, one, you accept less than you presently have, or two, you decide to take some form of action to put pressure on government. The president of Treasury Board, Neil Windsor, was out of town today and couldn't be contacted, but the union says the ball is in his court. The contract for hospital support staff expires tomorrow. The union's waiting to see whether government will appoint a conciliation board to mediate the dispute. Deanne Fleet, CBC News, St. John's. And that's the regional news. Greg. Another new twist today in the Iran arms deal. According to sources, the same U.S. planes which took weapons to Iran flew small arms ammunition to the Contra rebels on the way back. We'll have details when we return. What you're about to hear will mean absolutely nothing to you until June of 1987. Buy a new Escort, Lynx, Tempo, Topaz, or Ranger now at your participating Newfoundland Ford Mercury dealers. Pay nothing down and make no payments for six months. Incredible, but it's true. Or you may wish to choose the Ford 3.9% finance offer. Either way, you must take delivery before December 31st. Hurry before the best selection is gone, and so is this incredible offer from your Newfoundland Ford Mercury dealers. For a career that provides a world of adventure, Canadian Career Institute offers a 10-month program in travel and tourism that will qualify our graduates for a variety of positions within the travel field. Or if you prefer the exhilaration of banking, we offer the only bank teller data entry program available in the province, providing graduates with the necessary skills to work in any banking institution or data entry operation. Learn a living. Call Canadian Career Institute today. Teutons has been serving Newfoundland for over 80 Christmases. Here at Teutons, we know fast service is important to you, so we offer you a choice of less than one hour developing at our film in a flash outlets, plus hundreds of other convenient drop-off points. At Teutons, the focus is on quality. Teutons is Newfoundland's only Kodak Color Watch member. Enter our World of Color contest before January 17th. The prize is a trip for a family of four to Disney World. Excuse me, sir. Yes? Is it true that a Big Mac attack starts with a craving for two all-beef patties? Oh, boy, does it. Followed by a tendency to repeat yourself? Oh, boy, does it. Does and it. a total loss of concentration? What's that? A total loss of concentration. What's that? An inability to speak clearly. Now the good of Cindy at that. An urge to share? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, what about the Coke? Mm -hmm.
ABC Television Sales extends to clients and viewers alike a sincere thank you. It's been a pleasure serving you in 1986. The management and staff of CBC Sales are looking forward to 1987 and to the continuation of special relationships formed over the past year. From all of us at CBC Television Sales to all of you, a holiday season filled with love, laughter, and the kind of special memories that last a lifetime. Now to Toronto and Sheldon Turcott with the CBC National and International News. Good evening. A multi-million dollar lawsuit by New Brunswick Group is about to be filed against Dow Chemical in the United States. 200 lawsuits are being filed under the names of 97 living and dead workers exposed to defoliants while clearing rights of way. The men sprayed an herbicide to control underbrush for New Brunswick Power 20 to 30 years ago. Now they say they're suffering health effects similar to U.S. Vietnam veterans who sprayed Agent Orange. Ray Elstead reports. 20 to 30 years ago, NB Power hired summer work crews to spray the Dow herbicide brush kill along power lines. The sprayers say they were told the herbicide was safe enough to drink. They didn't wear protective clothing. They often came home drenched in herbicide. It was the same product that Dow sold under the name Agent Orange. American servicemen who sprayed it to kill the jungle in Vietnam claimed it caused cancer and birth defects. Dow recently agreed to pay them $180 million in an out-of-court settlement. In New Brunswick, two out of five names on the list of former sprayers are now the names of dead men. The living, who started banding together three years ago as the sprayers of Dioxin Association, say they're suffering from such things as cancer, nervous disorders, lung problems, and persistent skin rashes. They blame their health problems on the spray. Today, the sprayers laid that blame on the company's doorstep at a district court in Michigan, the home of Dow Chemical. They filed about 200 individual lawsuits on behalf of former sprayers and members of their families, with damages that could total millions of dollars. Some of them have been totally unable to work. Some of our people uh, are so ill that they are on welfare. Uh, they suffered uh, psychological damage, uh, damage to their families, uh, not just uh, the man who sprayed, but the man who sprayed and came in and picked up his two or three-year-old child or his baby. Wayne Hunter worked on the spray crews for three summers. He now suffers from high blood pressure and enlarged liver, diabetes, and arthritis because he believes he was drenched with herbicide on the power lines. Money will never buy your health. There's no way. As I was young and, and, and rugged, and now I, I'm still young, but I, I'm, I've had it. I was 44 year old when I took the heart attack, and I haven't done nothing since. For Hunter and other former sprayers, the biggest worry is how long this court case might take. The Vietnam veterans fought the Agent Orange case for more than five years before Dow gave in. Two more New Brunswick sprayers died during the past year, leaving 126 out of 204 still alive. A long court battle could mean even fewer will be left to benefit from any compensation. Roy Elston, CBC News, Fredericton. A midnight deadline looms over Canadian negotiators in Washington. They're trying to reach a compromise solution to end American tariff penalties against a key Canadian export, softwood lumber. If they don't succeed by midnight, a temporary 15% duty on Canadian imports will become permanent. The outcome of the softwood talks is considered vital to Canada because it will set the tone for future trade disputes. And further action against Canadian products by the U.S. is expected. Many observers say the U.S. Congress has become protectionist in mood and will oppose giving Canadian goods any breaks where U.S. industries are having hard times. For more than 12 days, France has been caught in one of the costliest and longest-running strikes in nearly 20 years. Prime Minister Jacques Chirac has scrambled to intervene. And as Don Murray reports from Paris, Chirac's government is coming under increasing pressure for its ineffective handling of the transportation dispute. For almost two weeks, trainmen have all but frozen the French railway system. Day after day, the same scene patient passengers waiting on empty platforms for the infrequent trains still running. The SNCF, the French National Railway Company, is losing $20 million a day, and many passengers are losing their holidays. The train system, however, is still crawling. Most of France's major ports, including the Port of Marseille, Europe's second largest, are blocked and locked by dock workers. Marseille has been a dead port for two and a half weeks. The cost, tens of millions of dollars with no end in sight. But the train strike is more important, both because of its impact on the public and because of its nature. 
It's a wildcat strike, almost unheard of in France, started and led by ordinary train men, train men who today voted to continue their walkout despite important government concessions last night. The naming of a special mediator and the decision to renegotiate a pay structure reform, a reform that had triggered the trainmen's anger. French railway union leaders haven't led this strike, they've followed it. Today, the communist-backed CGT held a rally outside of one of Paris's main train stations, a rally to back a continuation of the walkout. But for the moment, union leaders exercise little more control over the strikers than does the French government. Passengers aren't happy about the strike. I think it's a bad thing. But few seem very angry at the train men. They're only doing what students and farmers did, he says, putting pressure on the government to get what they want. They're weak, she says, but she's talking about government leaders, Prime Minister Jacques Chirac in particular, not about the strikers. It's that weakness that's got us into this mess. Coming so soon after massive student demonstrations against proposed educational reforms, these strikes are widely seen here as a key test for the government and for Prime Minister Chirac. But after 12 days of confusion and concessions, concessions which haven't yet appeased the strikers, most French commentators now believe the government has failed that test. Don Murray, CBC News, Paris. Ramification of the Iran arms deal continue to keep official Washington buzzing. News organizations now claim that same planes used to carry weapons to Iran used their return trip to fly small arms and ammunition to the Contra rebels in Central America. Eric Engberg of CBS News reports. Some of the planes that carried parts for missiles and air defense weapons to the Iranians were apparently used on their return trip from the Middle East to carry small arms and ammunition to the Nicaraguan Contras. It happened last May when the U.S. was barred by law from providing any military aid to the Contras, and it saved hundreds of thousands of dollars in transport costs. The use of one plane to do two jobs in two parts of the world suggests a high level of coordination and advanced planning to the White House operation, and it raises the question whether former NSC official Oliver North could have run the operation alone, as the White House has suggested. The Transoceanic Arms Odyssey began here in Texas at Kelly Air Force Base, where two Southern Air Transport planes chartered by the National Security Council loaded up with anti-aircraft weapons. They flew to Tel Aviv, where the equipment was transferred to someone else's planes for the trip to Iran. That left Southern Air with two empty planes. The airline won't say where they went, but records at the Lisbon Airport show two Southern 707s arriving from Tel Aviv within 48 hours of Robert McFarland's secret mission to deliver arms to Iran. The records show it took several hours to load both planes with defense material, and they headed out for Ilopango Air Base, the headquarters of the secret effort overseen by North to keep the Contras resupplied. It is not known how Southern Air was paid for these trips. Investigators will be asking because at the time it was not legal for the U.S. government to pay for or assist military aid to the Contras. Eric Engberg, CBS News, Washington. The world's largest oil company is getting out of South Africa. Exxon Corporation has sold its two affiliates in the country. Because there were no local buyers, an independent trust was set up to take over the company's operations. Exxon is the latest in a series of multinationals to quit the apartheid state. Most blame the poor economy and the government's race policies for their withdrawals. This is the warmest December in Calgary in almost 30 years, and it looks as though brown Christmas will be followed by a brown New Year's. And as David Kyle reports, the warm weather means headaches for ski hill operators. The temperature hit 10 degrees yesterday in Calgary. That's plus 10, a full 18 degrees above the long-term average for this time of year. It's been like this for a month now. For the first time in years, the Bow River hasn't frozen. The lack of snow has hurt snowblower sales. Motorcycles are selling better than snowmobiles. And while ski equipment is selling strong, some ski hill operators are complaining. Uh, you look out in your front yard and you can take your 10-speed down to the corner store and you can go out and play tennis. Uh, it's, it's pretty hard to convince people that it's ski season and it's time to be out on the slopes enjoying themselves. It's been seven weeks since the last snowfall at Lion Mountain. All the snow you see here is man-made, but it's often even too warm to make snow. One attempt led to a winter rain shower. At night, the machines can barely replace what melts during the day. If it wasn't for snowmaking equipment, what would this hill look like right now? Well, it'd probably look much like the parking lot does over there. It doesn't have to get, you know, minus 30. Minus 15 at night is perfect for us. That allows us to make snow probably warm up to, say, minus 5. That makes a comfortable skiing temperature. And yet, uh, we can continue to make snow 24 hours a day. 
but most people are satisfied to bask in the warm weather, which is expected to stick around well into the new year. David Kyle, CBC News, Calgary. That's the National News. I'm Sheldon Turcott. Carl Wells is here now with a weather update. Carl, uh, how are th how's things looking for uh, New Year's Eve? Well, uh, not too good for the island, Greg. It may not be too bad uh, in Labrador, but uh, on the island, uh, there is a low-pressure system moving in, and we're going to have strong winds tomorrow, which is not great news for the people planning to go down to the waterfront uh, no. tomorrow night in St. John's. We're going to have a strong easterly tomorrow night, folks. Anyway, about today, in Labrador, it was mainly cloudy with ice crystals in Labrador West. Temperatures there ranged from minus 9 to minus 13, got down to minus 20 in the west, though. On the island, mainly sunny with some cloud in the west. Temperatures from minus 2 to minus 4 for the most part today on the island. Tomorrow, a high-pressure system will give sunshine to Labrador and uh, the northern part of the island. Cloudy skies for everybody else from a low moving in from the American seaboard. Details on that later in the weather report. The federal government has made a number of changes to the Canada Pension Plan that comes into effect on January 1st. When we return, I'll look at the changes and how they affect some of us.